and then everybody who joins later can watch it later. Awesome. Well, uh, welcome to what month is this? May's Lunch and Learn. We're excited. This is our second San Diego user group meeting now. So we're going to be doing this every month. So everybody like keep checking your email and keep registering because this will be really fun. Today we're talking about uh, experience and how to land your next gig in the Salesforce ecosystem. And we have two awesome guest speakers, Taylor Jones and Ross Burton with us from Mason Frank. Um, but first, Tracy and I are going to talk at you for a little while. <laughs> and um, we do have lots of new people here today, so uh, we'll just do some quick introductions. So I'm Christy Brown. Um, I'm a Salesforce architect. I live here in San Diego, um, and I love just helping people learn and sending you resources. So never, never uh, be afraid to reach out. And um, I also love stickers. So if you want to do a sticker swap, I'm always, I'm always up for that. <laughs> You're always looking for the merch. <laughs> My God, like junkie. <laughs> <laughs> now you. All right. I am Tracy Hart. I'm a Salesforce administrator. Um, yes, or yarn. She'll take yarn donations too and trade that as well. A um, yes. couple certifications under my belt. I've been doing this, this admining for what? How many years now? We're in 2021, seven, like eight, six or seven think, years. Like, oh, yeah. shoot, eight years. Um, also a Salesforce junkie, um, not as uh, embarrassingly obvious about it as Christy is, but still a junkie too. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, let's just dump right into jump, not dump, jump right into it because I want to make sure we have lots of time for, for questions at the end. Um, so hopefully you're here to learn more about the Salesforce experience and how to translate that into your into your next job. And um, this actually came up from last month's meeting. We were talking about admins and how to get an admin job. And a lot of people were saying that they were told they didn't have enough experience, even though they've just spent like the last two years on Trailhead and they have their admin certification, but they have never actually had an admin job. And so we really wanted to dive into how do we translate your past job experience um, into what could be Salesforce experience and then you know, look for the right job and how to translate that to hiring managers and, and all that good stuff. Do you have anything to add on that, Tracy? Uh, yeah, I would just say that what we're talking about is not just specific to a career path as an admin. It's a career path as a developer, as a super user, as an architect, whatever like you are passionate about in the Salesforce ecosystem. All of the, the things that we're going to hit on today are applicable to, to any of those career paths. And business analysts. And that's business that's analysts. Up there and we go. Track. Yes. <laughs> Cool, so let's jump in. So um, chances are that you already have like half the qualifications that are listed on these job descriptions. So um, I think what we're recommending is that you read it like 500 times, make a list of all of those qualifications and then check off all the easy stuff like the five years of leadership experience or the communication skills, all these um, like more soft skills that of course you have that you're not gonna have to explain to anyone. And then look for the buzzwords. And I think, Tracy, you have a lot to say about the buzzwords. I do have a lot to say LinkedIn. about those buzzwords. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the, with the buzzwords, especially if you're perusing LinkedIn or any of those job sites, um, a, a common trick is to use those buzzwords within your resume themselves so that you're, you're automatically um, putting yourself at the top of the stack. Because we may communicate... Um, I am an automated automation expert, but to a lot of businesses, if I don't say I'm great at workflows, I'm great at process builder, I'm great at visual flow, they're gonna they are going to toss my resume aside because they it's not specific enough. They they aren't willing to take that chance on me. So we got to look at what they're listing themselves and be like, yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do that. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to list it in my resume too, maybe even in my cover letter, so that I I become a top priority. I think that also applies to you to even like Salesforce products. Like I think yes. I have every cloud and product that I call myself an expert in on my LinkedIn. And I'm sure that that's why recruiters are 
sending me stuff all the time because it's service cloud, it's sales cloud, it's Salesforce CPQ, it's Einstein analytics, it's all these different things. And they're looking for those buzzwords. So maybe they're not looking for Salesforce or they're looking for Salesforce plus Salesforce CPQ, something like that. So I think it's important to just dig through those requirements or qualifications rather, um, and do your best to put them on your resume. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you are applying through the, the job postings that you do find. I mean, we're all trying to get through that first level of, can we make it past the, the HR recruiter who's going to give us that, that cold call? And so listing off the things that they have written themselves just gives us that edge. Yeah, for sure. Um, emphasize results. So I do uh, a lot of the interviewing for, for our team here at Altium. And I don't necessarily care um, about what you, how you did something. I want to know like what you did and what that meant for your company. So like I can throw around a lot of buzzwords like I created 200 process builders to help automate stuff. Or I can say something more impactful like I increased efficiency by 35% for, for automating this manual business process for my sales team or something. And maybe at my last job, I did that in Excel or something, or, you know, on a piece of paper because, because I didn't have Salesforce and I can't be faulted for that. But now that I've done all these trailhead modules and I have my certification, I understand how all of those things translate into Salesforce now. Um, so I think, if you're talking about process logic and automation or efficiency like what rules did you put in place to you that that got you to that result um because as a hiring manager i can understand your thought process and also translate in, into salesforce so i don't necessarily need to know that you're an expert at flow builder, I need to know that you know that this data comes from over here and I need to like make these transformations and it results in this, which is going to be super dope for your team, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And also, don't be shy about the, the results you're emphasizing. I know for a lot of us, it's a big struggle to write flowery language about like, this awesome thing that I that I did or I helped to improve and it feels like you're you're almost being vain. That's not how it reads at all. It's in the more information you give and the more descriptive descriptive you are, it's it's better for the the um, process in general. So don't be afraid to talk about yourself. It, it doesn't read off as vanity in any way. I'm really proud of Tracy for saying that because both of us were looking at our LinkedIn uh, profiles the other day and I was telling her she needed to do that. And she was like, "You no, I don't want to talk about myself. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really have to take my own advice. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> um, let's see. So I just put a couple more examples of like what that could look like from various perspectives so you know you wrote a training guide or you reduced training costs or you uh, planned an event or something like these are the types of things that can be quantified of course and you know anything and and once we open up for questions and stuff we can talk about uh, specific scenarios and and whatnot um so here I, I just want to talk about those scenarios and maybe if you guys um want to put in the q a or the chat like some different things that we could try to dissect that would be cool um but uh, this first one so you wrote a training guide for your last company um so you can talk about how you're super detailed and organized and you love documentation because developers and admins like we all have to write documentation um so just focusing on those bits it doesn't matter that the training guide was like for a janitorial company on how to stock the bleach or something, you know, like those those little details doesn't matter. It's about how you got there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, and Tracy, you had when we were talking about this yesterday, a lot to say about like reporting and how that shouldn't be ignored. I mean, everyone uses Excel. <laughs> so how 100%. does that translate into I'm going to be a Salesforce reports power user, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you can do it in Excel, make sure that you can adopt those same skills in Salesforce and be able to be a reporting master as well. Because a lot of companies, they still rely on Excel heavily and they, they expect that from you in addition to your, your Salesforce skills. So don't knock them just because you, you only want to be a Salesforce admin or a Salesforce developer. Every skill is, is usable 
and marketable. And I think a little bit later, I'm going to talk more about soft skills, but I think um, I've mentored a, a couple of folks who were moving from the nonprofit world and had Salesforce experience there, but into a for-profit world. Um, and they were also being told that they didn't have enough experience, but I worked for the Girl Scouts, which is a nonprofit for like 10 years. And I think I did every job <laughs> in that place. Like I wore so many hats and I think that directly <laughs> translate to the work I do with Salesforce. You do everything. You're an analyst, you're a data architect, you're a process engineer, you're a this and a that and a whatever. Um, and so I think some of those soft skills of just like, I'm super flexible and can do anything that you throw at me. Um, you can speak to that a lot. Um, oh, Tracy's going to show you something cool now. <laughs> Yes. So we've talked about the, the nuts and bolts of the resume, you know, the thing that all of us essentially have to submit in order to, to even get considered. But what about like other things that we can do to give ourselves our, our, an edge? In this ecosystem, in this community, we are our own best marketers. And so how do we give ourselves an additional edge besides that stellar looking resume, you know? And so the one thing that I cannot recommend more is spinning up a dev org to highlight all of your best builds. I mean, there are times where I will build a really complicated approval process and I will just be like, oh, I need a moment because it's good. It's real good. You know, that's something that you should share. If it, if it like inspires that much pride in you, rebuild it in, in your dev org. Uh, give your dev org some kind of business model, you know, whatever that may be, whatever you closely relate to, and then build things around that so that you can highlight all of those awesome builds. Trailhead actually has some really awesome trails on not only using correct uh, language in your resume, um, prepping for those interviews when you get them, but they also have this particular module called build your personal portfolio on Salesforce. And I got to tell you, I uh, did it this week and it is a hoot and a half. I got so inspired when I was going through it because what it is, is it's having you spin up a dev org and then you are going to place all of your best stuff, including your uh, about me, your uh, resume, your education, highlights from your career in a community and then you can share that community on your LinkedIn on all of your socials it's was such a fun project to do and I could not recommend it more um, and it was a quick project to go through as well and it, it just got like those creative juices flowing so I've been I've been building my my little portfolio ever since customizing it as adding pages as I see fit um, so I cannot recommend that module enough I dropped um, the link in the chat too. Oh, thank you, Christy. The other thing that we've talked about briefly, but I, I want to hit on again is don't pigeonhole yourself. Um, you will see a lot of job descriptions where they will say, hey, we are looking for an expert in the service cloud. And you stop and think to yourself for a second, like, oh, I'm, I'm an expert in the service. That's Salesforce. That's just, <laughs> what are that? these people talking about? But if I don't advertise that I'm an expert in the service cloud, these poor people won't know that I'm the best person for the job. So make sure you know about all of the clouds. Make sure that you know about as many of the products that Salesforce has. You don't have to be an expert in any of them. You don't even have to like some of them. But knowing about them and being knowledgeable on them will give them, get you an edge. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to an interview where I've been asked a question about a Salesforce product, not that that company uses the Salesforce product, but it was almost just to test my Salesforce knowledge. Like, are you a true Salesforce administrator, you know? So that's just an important thing to remember. Even if you're not jazzed about a product, go on to Trailhead and do a couple modules so you can talk to it. And then the other thing that we talked about earlier was don't overlook the little things. I think all of us are, you know, if we've drank the Salesforce Kool-Aid, we are excited about, yeah, I know, Christy, I know you. <laughs> you drink it on the daily. Um, we are, we get so passionate about one particular thing, whether it's analytics or communities or Pardot, and we just obsess and obsess over those things until we, you know, we become an expert and perfect them. But that doesn't mean we should overlook the little things. A lot of companies aren't, can't afford these major products, and a lot of companies aren't ready for 
that level of sophistication. A lot of companies are looking for somebody to explain to them what the heck is the difference between a list view and a report and which one's better than the other and how the heck can I get the data in this one report? I'm making an opportunities report, but I'm not seeing this account data. Why is that? So your understanding of the, the little things in Salesforce, the relationship between the objects and being able to do those things fast and effectively and also teach others in the organization how to do it will again give you that edge that you need. Dang. <laughs> I really liked the trailhead. It was such a good trailhead. It was so good. <laughs> um, I, I think too that, that making your portfolio in a developer org is awesome and you can share the portfolio, but you can also put together other use cases in the developer org and then just show that in an interview really yes. necessary like yeah here's an example of a rad flow that i built out and it does this and it's going to be amazing type thing like it's it's your whole little showcase org that you can keep forever like as long as you keep using it within a year it won't go anywhere so exactly 100 percent. and then after you've built all of the these things again it's time to market yourself like nobody's business we are in 2021 we love the TikTok, the twitter all the things all those things it is time to market in a new and unique way so what i like to do is when i've made that awesome approval process in my dev org not only am i going to um you know advertise it in my portfolio but i'm going to go another step further and so what i like to do is i use this free tool called screencast-o-matic um, it's just basically a screen sharing tool i like this one in particular because it highlights my mouse so i feel like it's easier for the viewer to to watch what i'm doing um, and i record and myself talking through what I've built. And I make it no longer than two minutes. And then I put that thing I hosted on YouTube and then I can put that in my portfolio. I can put that in my LinkedIn as a LinkedIn post of like, hey, I made this really cool approval process that is able to you know, digest 3000 uh, approvals you know, in a, in a day, you know, something like that so that I not only get engagement on LinkedIn, but anybody who is looking at my profile has this history of what I've done even before they look at my resume. So these are, these are great things and easy and free things that you guys can do to give yourself an edge over everybody else. Everybody's going to be submitting a resume. What makes us different that gets us the job? Um, my other uh, suggestion would be to engage in all of those Salesforce related posts that you see on LinkedIn and Twitter. Engage with the community. You know, if 2020 taught us anything, well, it taught us a lot of things, but <laughs> it's, you know, virtual engagement is here to stay. And so engaging with people on Twitter that you've never met or on LinkedIn that you've never met is not you know, a fruitless cause. That's how you build your network. And that's how people, you know, start to know you, start to become comfortable with you, trust you, and maybe one day hire you. And share share job opportunities. With. Yeah. Like, I see so many jobs coming through, just people I follow on Twitter, like, hey, our team is hiring. I know that person. Like, if I wanted it, I'd probably reach out to them. And you can too. hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. I wanted to um, just talk briefly about soft skills too, um, and and don't ignore them. I think you know Salesforce or any technology is something that someone can be taught, but the things that I put on this slide, I think, are things that my team uses every day that we can't teach. Like you can't teach someone to be self motivated or to be <laughs> flexible or to be innovative. These are all things that. I'm looking for when I'm hiring a member of our team because that's what we need. We need like a self-starter go-getter, someone who loves Salesforce, who just wants to build cool stuff, you know, and for, you know, a purpose, not just for the hell of it. But um, <laughs> so I think pushing these things and being personable and, you know, telling someone your Salesforce goals for the next 10 years is a really positive thing. And that's for sure what I'm looking for. So it must be what other hiring managers are looking for to you. So don't forget to add some of these buzzwords to your, to your LinkedIn too and to your resume. And with that, we'll turn it over to the professionals. <laughs> we want to introduce Ross and Taylor and I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Well, thank you, Christy. Thank you, Tracy. Um, thanks for the introduction. Excited to be speaking on a, on a Salesforce user group again. Obviously, there's been a, a little bit of a delay um, since my last user group attendance over 12 months. I can't 
think as to why, but uh, it's nice to be back in this uh, community again. Um, I'm Ross Burton, the, uh, the Mason Frank office here in Irvine, uh, Southern California, the territory that I oversee is actually um, um, California itself. So I recruit in the end user space specifically uh, throughout California. I've been with Mason Frank eight years. It was eight years last month and I've traveled pretty much around the world with the organization since I started. So I've recruited Salesforce professionals throughout the world. Um, I, I really have. And I've also got Taylor Jones joining me on the call today. Taylor. Hi, hi everyone. It's, it's to me all 24 um, on the user group right now. I'm uh, Taylor. I'm literally sitting in the room next to Ross. So hopefully there's not an echo right now. Um, I'm our VP of customer success within our Revlent site. Um, I have been in the Salesforce talent space for the last six years. Um, the ecosystem evolved from looking with looking for individuals with sales, service, and marketing to now having Velocity, Capato, and all of these additional skill sets. Um, but within my role, I work every single day with individuals who are looking to kickstart their career in Salesforce. And on the flip side, I work with all of our external partners who are looking for talent. Um, I know we're both excited to be here and share some additional uh, tips. Quickly as well, one of the, the notes that I took from, from something Christy said, and I just wanted to emphasize was the met talked about. Um, that really is huge. I think if you are able to put metrics into a resume, the effect that you had for the business, the, 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 the profit margins that you increase, the bottom line at the end of the day is what businesses care about the most. So being able to, to talk about that in a resume was uh, is very important and certainly something I look for as, a, as an experienced Salesforce recruiter. So just wanted to point that little tip out again and, and, and say that that was a, a really good point and, and something that will help a lot um, to make you stand out. Perfect. So, oh, there we go. Um, Taylor, I think this is you. Yep. Um, so we just wanted to give you guys a bit of an overview as to what Revlin is, what's Mason Frank, we work together so it's not super confusing. Um, we are both part of what's called the 10th Revolution Group, um, and there's two different pillars to the business. So Revlin is the side that I work with, um, and we are aimed at building a, a talent a Salesforce ecosystem and bringing in net new talent. Um, we're also a Trailhead Academy authorized training provider. It's a tongue twister to say, so I'm just going to say we're part of the Trailhead Academy, um, which means that all of the content that we deliver throughout our program, and I'll give an overview a bit later, um, is certified and up to date from Salesforce. And then obviously on the Mason Frank side, um, we specialize only in the recruitment of Salesforce professionals. I think in the US uh, alone, we've got over 200 consultants that are uh, diversified into different sort of teams that focus on different areas of the Salesforce ecosystem. And if you click to the next slide, um, you can see here sort of the depth that we have in the, the sort of the Salesforce space. And the advice that I'm going to give is really going to be tailored around how you get into the Salesforce space and how you make that first step as someone who maybe has a little bit of experience in the platform and the product and um, into that role as an admin and, and, or a Salesforce analyst or a, a sales ops individual, making that first step is difficult. Um, and I actually receive probably like five to 10 calls a week to the office from people asking for this very advice. So I'm actually really excited to, to, to share this on a medium where hopefully, I think obviously this has been recorded as well, that we can share it with others that are really trying to make that step and that, that, that move into the Salesforce world because that first step is definitely the hardest one to take, um, and it, it does get a little bit easier, I think, after you make that make that jump. So, if we go to the next slide. Um, so, Mason Frank, um, global leaders in recruitment Salesforce professionals. We've been up and running since 2010. We've actually placed uh, 3,100 with 3,100 organizations across 43 different states in the U.S. Um, we've got 78,000 Salesforce professionals on our database, which is amazing. Um, and we are active sponsors of user group events and um, obviously other Salesforce events as well. And again, I think myself and Christy and Tracy were talking about a, a future event in, in San Diego that might be, could be potentially in person. We love to do this sort of stuff and, and help the ecosystem. Uh, then moving into sort of a little bit of an overview of why you want to get into the Salesforce market. So if you trying to make that break into the, the Salesforce space and you are struggling and um, don't lose hope, keep fighting, you will get there. And when you do, it's a super rewarding ecosystem. So if we go to the next slide here, 
Um, yeah, it's it's worth the effort, basically. So Salesforce as a whole, the adoption rates, um, if you look at the number of customers that Salesforce have right now, I think in uh, in 2016, I think it was 92,000 customers globally. Um, and now as we look, um, I think the data that we have from 2019, over 150,000. And I think now if you think about the adoption through the pandemic, we're probably talking over 200,000 customers worldwide. So the demand for talent is growing. The salary increases that we're seeing in the Salesforce uh, space year on year are, are fantastic. Like the demand for talent and the lack of supply obviously creates um, a, a, a very attractive proposition for people who are skilled with the platform and the salary increases are certainly very strong. And the supportive ecosystem as well, like we are on a call today as, as sort of users and, and professionals of Salesforce um, here in, in, in Southern California, San Diego specifically, this is amazing, this is awesome. You've got people like Christy, like Tracy that are happy to help and that is true across the whole ecosystem as well. Um, there's no signs of the demand slowing down. There's no signs of, of, of the, the growth slowing. Acquisitions left, right, and center. Tableau, MuleSoft, uh, Slack. I mean, these were not cheap purchases. These are huge investments from Salesforce, and they will continue to grow. They really, really will. So it's a, it's a great space to be in. And if any of you out there are struggling to get that first uh, step into the space, um, keep going. You will get there. And, and I, I know that Christy and, and Tracy will, will, will tell you it's definitely worth it. It's an amazing career and it's, uh, it's one that's ever growing as well. So next slide here. Um, okay. So how do you get into the Salesforce ecosystem? That Christy and um, Tracy talked about is definitely great advice and very specific to and very good for, for people trying to make the move into Salesforce. But what I wanted to do was really target and, and, and talk to you guys about how, if you don't have that experience as a Salesforce admin in an organization, how do you get that first sort of step on the ladder? So one thing that you guys can do um, is get industry specific. So Salesforce as an organization, when they go out to sell their product, their team, uh, their sales team into five key uh, divisions, and those divisions are vertically driven. So Salesforce themselves, I believe, are finance, non-for-profit, healthcare, retail, manufacturing, um, and they're the, the, the sort of the, the customer segments that Salesforce themselves have set out, and they target those customer segments from a sales perspective. Now, what we're seeing that translate to is the demand for talent in Salesforce now is starting to become more industry specific. So if a finance hiring for a Salesforce admin, they love to see a finance, um, a Salesforce admin that comes from a financial services background. And it's the same with education, it's the same with healthcare, it's the same with retail. Now what this means for people trying to make them move into the space is if you guys have experience in one of these verticals prior to um, obviously moving into Salesforce, let's say that you were in IT support at a university for, for, for two years, let's say that you worked as a financial analyst at a, a wealth advisory firm, you have industry specific knowledge that is very valuable. The way that different industries use Salesforce differs massively. I use Salesforce every day as a recruiter. Um, and I know that, uh, that, that the way that we use it is probably very different to the way that Altium um, uses Salesforce internally there. So those business processes for those verticals and you as an individual has an understanding of the industry instantly become more valuable to those organizations in those spaces. There are more industries than the ones I've listed here for sure, but I was just trying to get a general feel for some of the key industries that we see. So if you're applying to, to, to sort of make that step into the Salesforce space and you're struggling, but you've got a bit of a background in healthcare, for example, start targeting some more healthcare based organizations, start focusing in on that vertical. And I think that will really, really, really help. Perfect. Next slide. Okay. So within the Salesforce space, we have uh, the different um, that I've just talked about, the different industries, but we also have different types of organization within those verticals that use Salesforce. I've tried to break them down into four key organizations, and it's very important for you guys when you're applying for these jobs and you're, you're putting yourself out there, that you think about which box the company that you're applying to falls into within these four categories. Um, so the first one is uh, the partner and ISV space. So the partner and ISV space is obviously the, the, the input organizations that specialize in going out there and getting Salesforce working for different businesses um, across different verticals. We also have the ISV space um, where organizations have created a, a managed package of 
Salesforce platform, and they usually sell that specifically to a, a target vertical. These companies are implementers of technologies. They have um, different roles within the Salesforce ecosystem across sales, functional, technical, support, and they have very various different roles within those, um, within those sort of uh, capacities, I guess. All of these roles are very client facing. So you are there to, to, to sort of work with consultants and sorry, you're there to work with your clients and advise them on their use of Salesforce and better their use of Salesforce. And within the partner and ISV space, you are a billable head. You are out there generating revenue for the partner. So you've got to think when you're looking at these organizations, sort of the level of salary and the requirement that you're looking for has to then translate to what they can bill you out at in some way, shape or form. And that's just, the, the, the cold hard fact of that, right? That that's that's very true. So just think about that and, and the other things I've talked about there if you are applying to work for a partner in ISV. The second uh, company is the small end user, uh, the startup, the non-for-profit um, world um, is, is often sort of the the, the sort of the, the, the smaller end users that we see, uh, privately owned businesses, family owned businesses that have a lot of the time a very segmented use of Salesforce. So if you were to join that business, you would often be wearing many hats. You would be uh, the admin, the analyst, the VA, maybe uh, even sort of the, the project manager on occasions as well, right? So in that role and in that company, um, the diverse, the, the, the sort of a diverse skill set is very well received because you're going to be doing quite a lot. Sometimes the budgets within these naturally are a little bit lower as well. So for someone trying to make that step into the Salesforce space, coming probably from a, a slightly different salary level than someone who's got the experience, that could be super attractive for them, right? Because their budgets might be to, to the two types of companies we'll talk about now. So to company three is the, the, the mid-size end user, and this can really apply to any type of business, right? Um, it starts as privately owned, public companies, private equity, health organizations. And um, there's often um, multiple clouds that are used within the Salesforce system, uh, there's often complex integrations or, or other app exchange uh, products that are used there. They have small internal teams of one to five um, Salesforce heads, um, but everyone pitches in, everyone does a little bit, everyone helps out. However, there is sort of usually a key separation of responsibilities within these sort of mid-sized end users. So the admin might help with um, with some of the sort of the, I, I guess the, the requirements gathering, um, but often that will fall mainly to the BA, for example, and the developer will certainly take charge of, of, of things from a technical basis with input from the admin, but the development work, that will be the developer's job. So everyone pitches in, everyone workload, but there is a bit of a separation of responsibility. Um, as you're making the move into the Salesforce space, I don't know if companies the right organization for you. I personally think that company type two and company type four that I'll talk about now are probably the better organizations for you guys to be focusing on and applying to. So company four are the, the, the big enterprise end users, right? The huge organizations that have very complex Salesforce systems. They use multiple clouds. They've got million dollar integrations. They probably use MuleSoft to manage those integrations. And it's just a complex structure in terms of their use of Salesforce. And um, what's great about these organizations is they do have very large Salesforce teams and teams are very segmented by their job responsibilities and their job roles. Now, with a larger organization and the segmentation of those responsibilities, this does offer the opportunity for people with a lower level of experience to, to come in at the lower level um, uh, roles and really still offer exactly what that company wants from you. Yeah, they want someone who can come in and do low level admin responsibilities because that is the junior admin's responsibility within this organization. And then they also have a senior more complex stuff. So those bigger organizations that use the platform um, internationally, they can be a great um, sort of, um, I guess, organization for, for people that don't have that, that sort of two to three years of experience to target. And you might not think that from the outside looking in, but if you think about it from the way that they segment their team and the responsibilities, it definitely makes a lot of sense. So when you're applying to these uh, job adverts and you're tracking down the companies, try and have a think about which organization type am I reaching out to and really tailor the outreach um, based upon that. So the next slide um, is all around um, the, the sort of the person that you are actually applying to. Now, this is recruitment advice 101 right here. This is what we do as recruiters on a, on a daily basis. Now, each one of these individuals that I've sort of tried to profile here exists within most Salesforce uh, end users. Um, and each of them are super important in their own way. 
So we have the HR and the talent team, the Salesforce owner and the hiring manager. So if you are an individual who's applying for a role in the Salesforce space without experience um, in a, a sort of a, a live environment, so to speak, um, you are applying for an admin job, a Salesforce BA job, an analyst job, a lot of the time the application will go directly to HR and the talent team, which, which makes a lot of sense. Now, the HR, and the HR and the talent team often don't have as much exposure to the Salesforce platform as, let's say, the Salesforce owner or the hiring manager may. So when they're looking at a resume, they are looking for a list of skills. They're looking for requirements based upon what they've been educated is needed um, for the role by the Salesforce owner or the hiring manager. So when you're applying to these jobs, you've got to realize that the people that are looking at the resumes in the first instance aren't necessarily um, sort of skilled with the platform and aren't maybe going to see the value like someone like yourself as a junior position could bring to the table. So I think it's important to always engage with the HR and the talent team. But I think if you don't have that level of experience that the role sort of truly requires based on the job description, it's good to also try and track down the two other individuals that I talk about now. So the Salesforce owner and the hiring manager in different organizations, these can absolutely be the same person. But in some organizations, there's going to be three or four different Salesforce hiring managers. There's going to be one or two potentially different Salesforce owners. So a Salesforce owner could be someone like a CIO, a CTO, a, 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 a chief product officer, a, a CRM um, product manager. They can, they can hold a lot of different job titles. Customer success is a, is a new one. Chief revenue officer is another. There are so many different job titles that you can see that would translate to this person owning Salesforce. So they have control or ownership of the platform and um, they're the owner or at least a heavy influencer in the budget and the hiring process. And the, the thing about these individuals as, as, as sort of you guys look to target them, they see the bigger picture. They see the, understand the platform. They understand what someone who's a little bit more junior, but really hungry to, to prove themselves can really bring to the team. So when you are applying for these, to these jobs and you see that, okay, maybe I don't have the three years of experience that's listed on this resume, but you know what? I'm going to come and I'm going to give it my all and I'm going to be super valuable to this organization because I'm going to bring that tenacity and I'm going to prove myself. Try and target and, and find these Salesforce owners, these hiring managers, because they're going to appreciate that a lot because they've been in your shoes. They know what it's like and they know that someone with that lack of experience, but that, that tenacity that we've talked about can still bring up value to the to sort of to, to the organization and to the Salesforce org. When we look at hiring managers, those individuals are usually often architects, uh, development managers, senior Salesforce developers, senior Salesforce admins, yeah, that maybe report back into the Salesforce owner. So they hold a lot of the same responsibilities or, or, or sort of skills, I guess, as the Salesforce owner might. Um, but again, they're probably even more clued up with the platform than the Salesforce owner is because they're living in Salesforce every single day. So these two individuals, for me, are the right individuals targeting and if you see that a company is hiring you think that you're going to be applicable in terms of your vertical experience and the fact that you're you want to make that move into the salesforce space do a little bit of work on linkedin do turn put your recruiter hat on and and find who that salesforce owner is find who that hiring manager is and connect with them see if you have mutual connections use your network which which christian tracy talked about and and see if you can make an introduction that way because that is the only way that you can guarantee that they're going to see your application. That is the only way that you really can. And again, I think it's important to say it. They've been in your shoes. They appreciate the, the sort of the, the, the outreach and uh, that extra effort. So there we go. I think that's everything from my side, I believe. And I'll pass it over to Taylor now. We'll talk more about Revelant. Perfect. Thanks, Ross. I think one of the things that really stood out um, to me that Ross talked about it is specifically targeting the right people um, and just making sure that the messaging is different to each individual that you reach out to. Don't do blanketed emails of a very vague summary. If you reach out to town, you want to match those keywords like Christy and Tracy said. And then if it's a Salesforce owner, it's the hiring manager, they want to understand how can you help them solve a business issue or enhance the platform. So um, really, really useful information. So Christy, I think you're controlling the slides. You're gonna have to click through quite a few times on this slide. I think it's automated. Um, I just wanted to very quickly touch on the, the, the model of Revlon and what, 
what it is we do as a business because it is a bit unique to the market and, and it's a little different from just looking for your next sales force. So we at Revlin um, work off of a hire, train, place, and develop model. And what that means is within our organization, we hire the best and the brightest IT talent. So we take individuals who um, have experience as business analysts, maybe in different industries, or they have uh, development experience in different technologies that are interested in learning Salesforce. We put them through an eight to 12 week training program where we um, do pay during a week um, and we fund all of the training and certifications once individuals come out of training um, we place them so we actually hire the individuals uh, to be permanent employees of Revelance for a minimum of two years um, and help get them hands-on commercial experience with a number of different Salesforce partners and Salesforce end users um, and then most importantly uh, we spend a lot of time over the two years developing individuals and investing in the continuing the training with further certifications. Um, so if you want to jump to the next thing. So I'm kind of just going to summarize a lot of what's already been talked about by Tracy and Ross, which is fantastic because it means that we're all thinking on the same page. Um, so in, in terms of ways that you can make yourself stand out, number one, get involved in the, in the Trailblazer community. Um, if you are on this user meeting right now, you're halfway there, you've done most of the work, um, continue to look at other user groups within the Trailblazer community, look at the questions, comments, look at all of the job postings and, and get involved. Don't be afraid to ask questions. A lot of people are chatting in the chat here. Make sure that you translate that into the wider Trailblazer community as well. Number two, evaluate what skills are transferable. So we've talked about a lot of um, skills that you can look at in terms of soft skills or previous experience. Um, if we have any developers on the group, um, I would challenge you to think about your past coding experience and whether it's object oriented, let's say you have Java experience, do you understand how that's related to Apex? Or if you have JavaScript experience, how is that related to Visual Force or Lightning Web Components? And understand that it will be easier for you to make that transition because you have the fundamentals. Number three, creating your own projects and apps. Tracy talked about this. Um, this is your chance to get creative. So into creating the online portfolio, a lot of customers that we work with um, are looking for individuals thinking outside of the box, spending time on their own, creating their own mini projects um, or creating apps um, and starting with that online portfolio is really the first step. This 101, so starting to understand kind of normal business processes for the different sales, service and specific industries. Ross talked about this a lot. Um, but understanding fundamentally how a business works is half half of the battle. Um, if you are interested in working with an organization and you understand the sales process and how lead management works, make sure that you you highlight that in your skill set. Um, just like with customer service, if you understand case management and you come from a really strong call center customer service background, that can easily be translated into a role within the service cloud. Um, next up, becoming familiar with object-oriented programming. So the methodology is, is going to allow you to modularize the program, um, which can be copied and used in demand. And it definitely helps you speed up workflows immensely. Um, and then lastly, um, and probably most importantly for me, is reaching out to local organizations similar to Revelant, um, we are always looking to bring new individuals into the ecosystem um, and help jumpstart your career. There are a ton of organizations across the U.S. Um, that have kind of different missions um, and different structures in terms of training or full-time employment opportunities. Um, if anyone's interested in learning more about those, I'm also happy to, to speak with you after this um, and help guide you in the right direction. And that's it. I'm not sure, Tracy, Christy, if we're gonna open it to questions now. It looks like there's a lot of questions. Which we got have so many questions, it's awesome. <laughs> a lot of questions. <laughs> I keep getting DMs saying, oh my God, you guys are awesome. So good job, that was amazing. Um, 
So I, the one that I have my house, my mouse hovering over right now is, is there any indication of which industry is more stable or more promising in terms of career path? And Ross, I think that came in on your industry slide. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think it's funny because everything's changed in my job and every week I'm working with a different company. I'm in charge of the end user team for California, so I work with California end users and I work with such a diverse range of different industries. Um, right now I'm working with a, a manufacturing organization, I'm working with a, a sort of a business education company. I am working with a, a retail company. Um, so I think that the strength of the product really is dictating that there's not one specific industry that's outperforming another. I think when you're looking at sort of career trajectory um, within Salesforce, um, you want to look at an organization that's maybe using the product um, who's just re product and is, is hiring sort of a newer team because that can offer, I think, a, a little bit of a, a quicker growth uh, plan for someone who's coming into that team, in my opinion. I also think if you're looking for stability, then you also just need to look at the company itself. Don't look at the industry, look at the organization. How long have they been in business? Like, What's their revenue? What's their headcount? And if stability is important to you, it's not really an industry specific thing. It's, it's a company, in my opinion. So does that, I guess, answer the question? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Up in on that one as well, Christy, just from a, a relevant perspective, um, where we've been seeing a lot of the demand for new talent um, is within the, the Salesforce Industries team. So what velocity? So if you look at the public sector, energy and utilities, telecom, insurance um, and health insurance, that's where we're seeing a lot of the, the demand. And they're really looking for individuals that have that industry experience versus the, the actual Salesforce experience. And then I would say in addition to that, um, anyone who comes from a, a services background, I think COVID, you know, really rapidly expanded the use of cloud and organizations having to very quickly turn around customer service and making everything remotely. Um, so if you if you have a background in call center, case management, customer service, um, that is also one to look at. So not so much industry, that one's cloud. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's funny as well because, like, actually, in, in a, SAS, a sort of a startup organization, you can often find that there's really good career progression within Salesforce at a startup for the reasons that I said to begin with. So, like, startups, yeah, maybe they're not the most, I guess, um, secure organizations. If job security with career progression within Salesforce is then this startup, obviously, they started using Salesforce when they started and they're a startup. So, you could come in as the second maybe even first admin and you can own that platform, right? And you can build it and you can progress quite quickly. So it's, it's, it's always an interesting balance um, that we see. Awesome, thank you. We have another one. Um, where would you say specific skills come into play in the job hunt? So I think the way, the way that I'm understanding that question is like maybe someone who's a little bit more experienced, right? Someone who's, who's got the, the sort of the, the background and the knowledge with Salesforce has been working in the space for sort of two to three years, maybe at a minimum level. I'd say that's when the specific skills really come into play. Um, I think that's when you need to, to, to sort of do some of the things that uh, that Christy talked about, um, sort of the metrics on the resume, the, the, the sort of the different products that you've worked with, um, the different app exchange integrations that you've been, been a part of what you've done within the team. I'd say that's when that starts to become really important and, and separates you from, from other individuals. Um, I see a lot of CVs of admins that have been working with Salesforce for three or four years and they say dashboard reports security. And that's it. There's, there's nothing else. And I'm sure they've done so much more than that, but they've not listed that. And I think just going ahead and, and following that advice, uh, the metrics, the improvements you've made, the products that you've worked with, that becomes super because that makes your resume really pop. In my Did opinion. you literally look at my LinkedIn profile before saying that? This is what Christy's <laughs> on my case about, darn it. <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> 
you know, there's actually so on your on your uh, trailhead or your trailblazer.me profile, there's like that little pie chart that says all the different areas of the modules that you've done. And that's a really great place to just steal. Oh, yeah, I know about security. I know about Apex. I know about automation. I know about so just like steal that little chart and put it somewhere. And that's, you know, one step up already. <laughs> um, another question. Um, I'm new into the Salesforce ecosystem and I'm loving it. What is the best way to, or sorry, what is the best approach for someone like me to choose in terms of the type of company? I'm more into learning on the job. So the, I think the type of company, right? Um, one of the great things about Salesforce is it's, it's, it's used by so many different diverse organizations. So I think if you, if you've got time in your job search and you have that luxury and you, you're not looking to make a step immediately, you can really sort of target organizations based upon like what you're passionate about. So I always make the joke, I'm, I'm a, a golf fanatic, right? So the PGA tour rang me and said, Ross, we need a head of recruitment for the PGA. I might not be recruiting for Salesforce professionals anymore. So I think that luxury of time, you can really target organizations that you would be passionate about working for and you can really get behind their mission. Now, obviously not everyone has that and that's an ideal scenario, but I think if, if you are afforded that, then why not? If you love um, crochet, like Christy does, like go and, go and build, go, go and manage the, the, the Salesforce platform for, for Crochet International or knitting, uh, yeah. knitting uh, USA, because you're gonna love it even more. Um, I think that's that's the sort of the way that I'd- I, So the slide where you were showing the, the four different types of companies mm -hmm. it, it made me think of the start of my salesforce career where i was a solo admin for the longest time and it made me jealous of that option four where it's a, a big enterprise company and you you come in as the small junior admin and the opportunity to learn from the those above you oh my gosh that just makes me like jealous inside like i wish that had been my path i mean i, I took this path for a reason but like <laughs> if you get that opportunity to to learn from others directly in the job that you're at that's that's priceless knowledge right there for sure okay another one how long would you say is too long to stay in the same position without progressing to a better role i, I think it's all about there's, there's no wrong amount of time to stay in a job as long as you're learning new things yeah so if at the organization you are at, you are constantly sort of being challenged and you're gaining new responsibilities based upon the opportunity to gain those responsibilities through good performance right then i don't think you need to look anywhere else i i, I don't i think if you've got that continued continuation of learning then you're in a good place i think when you hit a ceiling and you feel like there's nowhere else for you to go and you do become maybe a little bit disengaged because of that then absolutely that's the, the right time to, to start thinking, okay, like maybe a, a change would give me the, the sort of the motivation and the energy I'm looking for again. But I, I also think um, it's really important to speak to your management, right? Uh, I think people can be scared to speak with their managers when they are feeling like that. You don't know what's around the corner. You don't know um, within your organization what the plans are. Um, we don't get told everything as the employees. We get told a lot, but not everything. So speak with your manager if you're feeling like that and have that conversation and, and, and see if there's an opportunity for you to do something else and, and, and sort of get your, get your, dip your toes in, in development if you're an admin. Um, and then if you've exhausted those options, and it's just maybe the right time. Um, then, then I think that's the, the, the time when you should consider what else is out there. Nice. There's a ton of talk going on over here about like interview prep and resume reviews and stuff. And I don't want to put you guys on the spot, but would you guys be open to talking to people outside of this and, and reviewing that type of stuff? Absolutely. No, I, I 100%. I think um, interview preparation is, is one of the most um, undervalued parts of the, the job seeking process, uh, in my opinion someone who is a 60 percent 50 percent fit but prepares themselves well professionally and goes above and beyond i think personally from in my opinion when i look to hire as a hiring manager i think it makes them more appealing than the person who's a the role based upon the skills 
So interview preparation is, is, is really key. The resume stuff for me is really simple. It, it comes back to the metrics. It comes back to, to, to not just having those three or four keywords, but explaining a little bit more about what you did within the Salesforce platform and what effect that had. Um, but again, um, offline, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm happy to speak with anyone and, and, and talk them through what a resume should look like and, and, and also any tips and tricks I can give for going into to sort of an interview. There's no tricks when I say that. I mean, what I mean is just the, what you should prepare for going into uh, to an interview. And it looks like a lot of people are offering to review and, and send resumes for review. I think um, we could use our uh, chatter community for that. So just the user group community, um, make sure you, you register there too and for the group so you keep getting our emails but we can continue this conversation there everybody can get connected on linkedin and stock each other's stuff and make tips or yeah let's do it things. <laughs> yes <laughs> um ross and taylor that was amazing thank you so much i can tell from the conversation over here that this is super helpful for everybody and everyone who's going to watch this recording afterwards um don't forget we'll have another meeting next month it's always the third thursday so put it on your calendar lunch and learns whoop, whoop. hopefully someday they'll be in person again <laughs> soon we're gonna make it happen and for those who are asking we are going to post this recording in the um on the, event, on page. the event page and then uh are we able to share the slides as well we could do that in our uh group yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then we'll, we'll get the conversation there. started with all of these great questions that have already started a, a connection. This is just all awesome stuff. Yes. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.